You're on the air. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Good evening. Welcome to the Candidates Forum for Muscatine Mayor and City Council. The League of Women Voters of Muscatine County sponsors this voter service event. And on behalf of the League, I welcome all of the candidates. Running unopposed in the first ward is Phil Fitzgerald, third ward Tom Spread, at large Osama Shahade. People running con in contested races <coughs> are in the fifth ward Alan Harvey and Jeanette Phillips, and for mayor Diane Roby, Dwayne Hoppy Hopkins, Kim Otto, and Roger Roth. I am Sue Johansson, your moderator for the evening, and we are in City Council Chambers at Muscatine City Hall. I thank the city for opening this space to, for us tonight, and prior to this forum, the Muscatine High School 11th grade G squared humanities students presented information relating to city government. Students have combined journalism and government lessons in order to create projects of interest, including the elimination of speed cameras, the beautification of Muscatine, increasing shopping options in our downtown and mall, and other timely topics. Students polled residents, conducted field studies, and researched their issues. Thanks to all who were here to hear their ideas and to see the culmination of their work. The League of Women Voters of Muscatine County feels privileged to be able to host this forum. We are grateful for the opportunity to learn more about our candidates and uh, who want to serve the people of Muscatine. We appreciate all of you being here tonight in the audience and those who are at home watching. We hope that tonight's forum will be beneficial to all of the voters in selecting candidates when you go to the polls to vote on November the 8th. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government. The League does not support any candidate. The League also influences public policy through education and advocacy. Through voter service activities, information on candidates and election issues <coughs> are provided and voter participation is promoted. This forum is a voter service event, and tonight's Candidates Night is a chance to learn more about the people running for the fifth ward <coughs> and mayor. Our first question goes to um, uh, one of our 11th grade G squared students came from the audience, and so our first question is to Mr. Porter. Go ahead. All right. The question for myself was, please explain the G squared program and how it's better than traditional classes. Um, I personally believe that for my career that I pursue, technology is a huge skill that we need, and so I know many other classmates of mine agree with that, and also, uh, I enjoy working with small classes with my peers and doing strictly hands-on stuff. You know, less book reading, more going out and doing. Thank you very much, <coughs> Joe. Um, we appreciate the high school students being here to help us with this forum. Um, we hope that we are um, generating uh, a new generation of voters who will be active in citizenship and in their government to come. They are our future, and we hope that uh, this um, introduction to them will be a good one. So now we have three people who are running unopposed for city council seats, and we'd like to give them an opportunity to speak to the voters. Uh, we have Phil Fitzgerald in the first ward, Tom Spread in the third ward, and Osama Shahade serving at large. Uh, we'd like to give each of them four minutes to make a statement, and Phil, we'll start with you. Thank you. I want to thank the League uh, for organizing this event tonight. They've done an excellent job over the years. <clears throat> I've been a resident of Muscatine for 36 years. We moved here in 1975 from central Iowa. Uh, I'm married. My wife, Mary Jo. We have three children who are all married. Um, my oldest one, Jennifer, is married to Eric Peterson. And they have two daughters, Autumn and Skyler. They re reside in Muscatine. My number two child, my son, uh, Daniel, is married to Brienne, and they have two boys, Declan and Killian. They recently moved to Oskaloosa, Iowa. Uh, and my youngest, Kathleen, is married to Todd Jacobs, and they have one child, Stella, and they live in Cedar Rapids. Uh, as far as education, I have a bachelor's of science degree <coughs> in industrial education from Iowa State University. 
uh, plus a variety of hours beyond that in education. Uh, I'm a retired school teacher after 35 years. I've been retired a year, year and a half. And I'm currently self-employed contractor running Fitzgerald Construction. <clears throat> I've served on first, as first ward city council person for 20 years and I'd like to continue uh, for another term. Uh, three, I, three things that I would like to mention as major accomplishments in, uh, over, in the last five to 10 years uh, that I've been instrumental in, in bringing uh, together. The first one would be joint, Muscatine County Joint Communications. Uh, we put together the city and the county dispatch centers into one, one group. It's called MUSCOM by the people that have to get to work with it. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity to combine services and, and end up saving the taxpayers of Muscatine City and County uh, considerable tax dollars. Second project uh, is uh, usually referred to as MAGIC. It's the Muscatine Area Geographical Information Consortium. That's why we call it MAGIC. It's a lot quicker. The uh, city of Muscatine has made uh, <coughs> exceptional use of this uh, system uh, for mapping. Uh, the dispatch center uses the mapping. Uh, it's used by the county for parcel parcel information. If you want to find out what your neighbor paid for their house, you can go on Magic and find out and snoop uh, as much as you want. Uh, the third item I would mention is a roadway maintenance program. We used to have a system called, uh, I think this is a good road to redo this year, and then it got finished um, or worked on. And we now have a system in place that has taken uh, statistical information from the roadway uh, traffic counts, condition of the roadway, and so forth. And we're using that currently to identify the, uh, what needs to get done. So I'd appreciate your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Spread. <clears throat> Good evening, and thank you as well. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity this evening. Um, my wife and I moved to town 12 years ago. At the time, my daughter was a senior in high school, and I can you can all imagine what a challenge that is for her. But uh, we made it through that. She has since gone away to college, graduated, got married, came back to live here in Muscatine and has a little boy. So I, I feel like we have uh, uh, family roots in, in Muscatine now and, and therefore I have a vested interest in what happens in our community. Uh, in terms of my educational background, uh, let me back up. I was born and raised in the city of Chicago I come from a long line of, of uh, city employees on both sides of the family, so local politics was something that was just valued and discussed every night at the dinner <coughs> table. Uh, so I have that interest, and when I went off to school, I went to McMurray College, which is in Jacksonville, Illinois, primarily because they offered an, uh, a major course of study called Urban Studies. My intention was to become an urban planner or a city manager. I wound up graduating from McMurray with a triple major in urban studies, economics, and business, and later on got an MBA from University of Illinois. I am a community banker by trade and happen to work at a place in town called Community Bank. Uh, I've been in the banking business uh, for 34 years, again the last 12 here in town. I have extensive experience with GMCCI. I actually was one of a 10-person committee that helped create that organization when we merged the Chamber and the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, so that is a bit about my, uh, my, my technical and professional background. As far as my interest in, in running now, uh, as you were aware, it's an unopposed uh, uh, election for the seat vacated by Jerry Lang. Uh, I, I have uh, a sincere interest in helping do what I can to make this a more vibrant community. Uh, I have a deep understanding of how local government works, and in particular, I have a, a solid understanding of fund accounting, which is important in this line of work, as we, a vast majority of what we do is deal with budgetary matters. So what I can assure you is that I will give thoughtful consideration to all issues that come before the city and do my very best to represent you. Thank you. Thank you. And Osama Shahade. Uh, thank you, Sue, along with uh, League of Women Voters for hosting us tonight. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it has been my honor and privilege to serve the people of Muscatine the past eight years. 
and at the urging of many uh, family members and friends, I am seeking a third four-year term on the Muscatine City Council. When I ran eight years ago, I made two, two commitments to the city of Muscatine and to the people. First, work hard to control city property tax growth, and second, focus city efforts on the effective provision of essential city services. From those two commitments, I never wavered and sincerely hope that my efforts have made a difference in Muscatine. I am also not afraid to be the lone voice on issues when it's necessary, and I am very proud of my voting records in attempt to provide the best for the citizen of Muscatine and the community as a whole. My wife Mary and I, we have been married for 27 years. Uh, I came to Muscatine in 1984. Both my wife and I are very proud of two daughters that we have. I do appreciate your support and do appreciate your continuous support on November 8. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. <clears throat> um, why don't we give them a little round of applause and give you an opportunity if you want to. If you'd like to move into the audience, you can. Oh. And we will turn our attention to the first contested race of the evening. This is, we have two candidates running in the fifth ward. And there were two questions that were provided to these candidates in advance. The other questions have come from you, the audience, and Joe's going to help me with those. Uh, we're going to use a rotation as to who speaks first throughout the questions. We've got some time limits. and. Um, if you need cards, uh, we can certainly get those to you, and there are some in the back. Um, we have Jeanette Phillips and Alan Harvey with us. They each have two minutes to tell us about the skills and experiences that uh, they will bring to the City Council and one area on which they'd like to focus uh, if they are elected. And Jeanette, we're going to start with you. Thank you, Sue, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for having this tonight. But before I say anything else, I'd like to say, wow, those students were marvelous. And we really don't need to worry about the future of Muscatine because they were that good. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope whoever their teacher is gives them all an A+. Good. Think you can do that? I think she's in the front row and uh, I, she's listening. Okay. Um, <coughs> I come from a very large family. I was one of the sticks here in town. They do construction and everything, and we certainly learned how to get along with each other. There were 12 of us, so uh, that has helped working with other people. My husband is Alan. We have four children and several grandchildren, and then those great-grandchildren, too. We've been married 55 years and lived here for about 60, 60 of them, okay? Um, the reason I am running tonight is I was on the board, the council before, and just simply enjoyed it so much. I like to, to look at both sides of the issue and then figure out which side was the one I wanted to vote for. Um, hmm, I've got to skip about five lines here, ladies. I was on many boards and commissions as a member of the, of the council, and um, <laughs> I think my favorite board was the, when, the ones where we appoint the judicial magistrate people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Alan Harvey, we'd like to hear um, <coughs> from you in terms of your skills and experience that you'll bring to the City Council and an area of focus if you're elected. Well, I moved to Muscatine in 1969 right out, out of college. Uh, I've been here in Muscatine for the last uh, 40 plus years. Uh, married a local girl and have uh, two stepsons. 
I worked at GPC in research and engineering management and retired from GPC uh, after 34 years of service. I have a degree in engineering and a degree in uh, business. I took an uh, active interest in the Muscatine City Council uh, uh, many years ago, and I have served on the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Zoning Board of Adjustment for a combined total of over 22 years, and I have chaired both of those commissions uh, for many years. I was part of the Graffiti Mitigation uh, Committee that uh, was assembled several years ago. I have served on the Muscatine Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee and uh, 10 years ago and we are now uh, going to update that comprehensive plan so I'll be involved in that again. Since my retirement I became even more interested in Muscatine City uh, Government and so I started to uh, attend all the City Council meetings that I, I could. I've attended all the uh, council budget meetings for the last several years and so I know the ins and, uh, ins and outs and the discussions and the problems they have with uh, uh, finalizing a, a budget and I am not uh, afraid to stand up and be heard uh, whether they're pro or con and as uh, most people said uh, you know the city budget is critical at this time and I'm going to try to uh, not uh, uh, increase our uh, city budget but maintain uh, focus on public safety and maintaining our infrastructure. Thank you. Um, the second question that we pose to the candidates in advance is would you please identify areas of the budget that you might increase or decrease if elected and you'll have um, about a minute and a half to answer. So Alan we're going to ask you to go first on this one. Well, as I just mentioned, uh, my focus will be on uh, two areas, public safety, because I'm a firm believer in the primary responsibility of any government is for the safety of its citizens. So in this case, uh, that includes police protection, fire protection, and animal control. And I also want to focus on uh, maintaining our infrastructure, including streets, sewers, and waste disposal. Thank you. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. That's go fine. ahead. Yeah. And uh, I will support those, uh, not necessarily increasing budgets, but uh, if push comes to shove, I think those will get my priorities, and we'll have to do the balancing act uh, between funding other types of city efforts and maintaining the public safety in our current in infrastructure. Thank you, and Jeanette. And I agree with Alan on that. I have uh, support strong police and fire. And we just received a grant for two additional fire or, or police officers, which we really need. Uh, the fire department has received um, a reading of it's a three and when you have a rating of three, for, then your insurance rate go down for your citizens. Other than that, I'm going to wait for the budget sessions. And I've been looking through the book at the different areas to increase and decrease. And just wait until budget time to make up my mind where we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Joe, um, go ahead with our first question from the audience. All right. Uh, and, oh, just give me just a second here. Let's see. We're going to continue with the rotation of speakers. Joe's going to help us with questions. We're going to address questions from the audience for about 20 minutes. And the candidates are going to have a minute and a half to answer. And uh, Joe and I have been reading the questions. And when we can, we're clumping them together if they're on the same topic. Um, so we reserve the right to modify and, and group items that are similar together. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, the first question is, Muscatine ranks first in the state of Iowa for pollution of the air we breathe. Are you willing to address GPC and Muscatine Power and Water to start efforts for immediately for cleanup? Um, Jeanette, we're going to have you take that one first. All right. Yes, if we're number one, we need to do that. Thank you. 
And Alan? Uh, it's a pretty simple answer, I guess. It, uh, yes, uh, once the uh, uh, contributors to the pollution are identified, which they have been, I think uh, we need to proceed with all the uh, steps we can to reduce the pollution and uh, help those industries uh, uh, do what they can and uh, support any efforts uh, along those lines. Okay, thank you. Next question, Joe. All right, the next question is, property taxes continue to rise while property values continue to decline. Do you see this as a problem? If so, what would you do about it if elected? And Alan, we're gonna give this one to you first. We all recognize that uh, these are tough economic times, uh, particularly uh, for the nation and for Muscatine. Uh, I think it's very important that during the budget sessions that uh, we try to control the city budget at least to the extent that we don't raise the property taxes on our citizens and in that effort I think some of the uh, areas that we might be able to help the city of Muscatine is broadening the scope of the current uh, tax increment financing uh, area to uh, help promote the city and gain a tax base and I think we can maybe offer some tax incentives incentives to allow uh, local businesses and new businesses to come into the Muscat uh, Muscatine because they find it an attractive place to be. Thank you. And Jeanette? I agree that property taxes have gone up quite a bit. Um, I did talk with the finance department about this and it is not just the city council that's raising them. Part of your, your taxes that you pay come from the county supervisors and also from the school board. And the school board has gone up quite a bit recently. And so they also need to watch it and, and make sure that they keep it down. Okay, thank you. Joe? All right, the next question is, the journal has stories of arrests for illegal drug possession and delivery, sexual and domestic abuse, and other serious crimes in Muscatine almost daily. If you are elected, please give at least one action you would suggest to decrease the incident of crime in Muscatine. Jeanette, we're going to go with you first. All right. I do see this, and I see it as a problem. I work up at the juvenile detention center and two of the rooms up there were paid for with muscatine dollars and so your muscatine people that get in trouble go up to that building for their education and and to be incarcerated uh, how to cut it down you know i wish i knew because it's getting the numbers get more and more every year i've been there for about 12 years and it's really a problem. Thank you. Alan? Well, first of all, I'd like to at least maintain our current uh, uh, police department's uh, staffing uh, situation. And if possible, uh, as we're starting to do this year, is to uh, have police officers specifically for street, uh, street crime units and have some officers uh, placed in the school system as liaison office officers to uh, be there uh, with the students and address any concerns that they may have uh, in the school system. And uh, I think the you know the the drug task uh, task force and the uh, uh, gang task force are an important aspect of controlling the, the crime in Muscatine. Thank you. Got another one? Yep. The next question is, in your opinion, should firefighters be able to be on city streets to raise money? Alan, what do you think? I have mixed opinions on that because uh, I know the uh, currently the firefighters are, are at various intersections, uh, off-duty firefighter, firefighters not in uniform uh, to uh, collect. 
some other towns uh, such as up in the Quad Cities, they are actually in uniform and I don't know for a fact, but I assume there might be on the clock when they're doing that. But I would say I don't have an objection to the current system, uh, but I would not uh, ever want to approve them being in uniform and being on the clock uh, during those times. Thank you. Jeanette? I would approve of them being in uniform but not being on the clock. I've, uh, we did it before when I was here before, and it worked out fine, and that it's a worthy cause that they're out there for, and, and they raised a lot of money, so yes, they do have my approval. Thank you. Another question, Joe? Yes. Oh. The next question is, will you pursue involuntary annexation of property outside of the bypass? And if so, what services are you willing to provide for those residents? Jeanette? I have a slight problem with that question because I have one grandson on 38 and another one on 22, and neither one wants to be annexed. So they would be part of that. It's an 80-20% <coughs> um, annexation. So they both would be part of the 20%. So I would have to study that a lot before I voted for it. Um, the SETI services, I think they should have what everybody else gets. Okay, thank you. Alan? Uh, I'm in favor of the voluntary annexations, and we just had two uh, examples of that in the last year where uh, two separate parcels came into the city. Uh, involuntary annexation is a little bit more complicated because uh, I, you, I don't approve of annexing simply, you know, to get the increase in the tax base because uh, that comes with a cost. And I don't know that uh, the city uh, would come out ahead by an involuntary annexing the areas uh, and then provide uh, like s streets, sewers, et cetera, to that area. So I think before we could ever do a vol involuntary annexation, we'd have to really uh, present a case, particularly to the state uh, officials, to uh, uh, indicate why GPC, or GPC, why Muscatine uh, uh, would benefit and how the residents of the involuntary uh, areas uh, would benefit from being annexed. Okay. Thank you. The next question of the evening is, diversification of Muscatine's economy can develop a healthy city. How can we diversify Muscatine's employment risk and reliance on one or two large manufacturers for all our jobs? Alan, have you got a thought on that? Yes. Uh, I think one of the big uh, areas that we can do is to uh, help encourage uh, businesses, new businesses to come into the city of Muscatine and I would do that by broadening the scope of the, the TIF funds. Uh, I think that we can, there's a lot more that can be done uh, using TIF incentives not only to bring uh, business into Muscatine but to improve our existing infrastructure which would attract maybe more businesses and even to broaden the scope to where it could be used for some residential uses which it uh, presently is not used for and I also think that uh, we could use more in the way of uh, tax incentives to you know uh, as businesses come in and they're uh, to uh, say uh, prorate their tax taxes over say a t I'm just picking a number now 10 year period or or, or that sort to uh, so they wouldn't have the increased uh, tax burden just on day one. Thank you. Jeanette? To broaden our economic development, I think the improvements at the airport certainly would attract people from out of town. I also agree with him that the TIF areas that we have um, are very attractive. I. Today I ask my students what they would like to see, you know, come to town. And some of their answers were very interesting. It was uh, 
they spend their own money because they have their own jobs. So they want things like um, uh, some place to go to get the UGG boots that are over $100 a pair. Uh, somebody else said the sneakers, <coughs> that she paid $160 for her sneakers at the finish line. Uh, we don't have an Old Navy store here. Um, jeans with holes, they would go someplace to get jeans with holes. And let's see, tattoos. Another girl said purses. She paid $200 for her purses. And surely we could get these businesses to come to Muscatine because they're getting the money, you know, out of town. And I'd like to see them come here and spend it. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Joe, what's next? <clears throat> Will you look for the repeal of the unconstitutional pit bull dog law in its entirety? Jeanette? I think I probably did that. <laughs> no, I don't look for the repeal of it. I would have to do a lot of research. I'd, the other thing is you have to listen to your people. And if the people call you, email you, and everything enough, then you go ahead and you do what they say. Thank you. Alan? <coughs> well, the short, short answer is no, I would not uh, repeal that. Uh, each dog is an individual, uh, just like uh, every person is an individual, but they can't lose sight of the fact that pit bulls uh, uh, are bred to be a fighting dog, and so many times <clears throat> the owners of pit bulls, you know, there are responsible owners and irresponsible owners, so unfortunately the laws have to be written to, you know, to cover all uh, what might be termed vicious animals, and unfortunately, uh, pit bulls fall in that classification. Thank you. Okay. The next <clears throat> question is, what's your stance on all the speed cameras around town? <laughs> Alan? Uh, I have no uh, issues with the speed cameras. Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, people who are upset with the fact that they are uh, here. Uh, ignoring the monetary aspects for the uh, for the moment, uh, since the speed cameras have been in, uh, put into uh, use, there have been uh, over 14,000 citations issued. Uh, only seven of seven of those citations have been appealed to a court, uh, so that would indicate that uh, those citations are probably legitimate. Uh, at the intersections where the cameras are located, before the cameras were there, uh, there are 24 reportable accidents since the cameras have been in effect. There, that has dropped to 16 uh, reportable accidents. When the cameras first went into effect, there was uh, over 4,000 citations it, uh, issued. And in the last uh, months of the my latest data is about the middle of August that those citations have dropped to 2,200, which is about a 50% reduction in uh, citations. And what really struck me is uh, speed going through the red lights. Uh, there have been over 1,200 citations written for drivers going over 15 miles an hour above the speed limit going through red lights. And there has been five citations issued for people going over 60 miles an hour through the red light. Okay, thank you. Jeanette, what's this, your take on speed cameras? Ready. Yeah. <laughs> this is another area where I think I should listen to the people. I put it out on my Facebook. I asked them how they felt about it. And so far, I have gotten nothing but keep the cameras. Said so they're slowing down the traffic on, on the bypass. And actually, if, if you look around, Muscatine people do obey the speed limit. By and large, they're people that do obey the laws here in town. Sounds like quite a few of them have a lesson to learn, but once they get a ticket, I'm sure that it won't happen again. 
But I will listen to people, and I, if they want me to vote to eliminate them, fine. Okay, thank you. The next question is, how will you use the hotel motel tax? Jeanette will ask that one to you first. Okay. Yeah. I would imagine we'll use it the same way we always have. It's been there forever. Okay. Thank you. Alan? Well, currently, the, the, well, the hotel motel tax was, uh, the original inception was to support, uh, like the Chamber of Commerce, and they do get uh, some of those funds. Uh, some of the other funds from the hotel motel tax are used uh, for cities' uh, expenses beyond just the Chamber of Commerce. So at the moment, I guess I would uh, leave it the way it is, but I would not be opposed to redistributing those funds uh, when budget session comes up and some more of the uh, facts come before the uh, city council. Thank you. We have another one? Um, the following question actually has two questions for the topic, so I'll read both <coughs> and then uh, have you state how you feel on the topic. The first one would be, would you be receptive to have the, the final decision concerning the Mississippi Drive Corridor project decided by referendum? And the second question is, do you favor one of the Mississippi Drive Corridor project alternatives? If so, which one? And do you have any concerns about this project? If so, what are they? So there are a couple of questions <clears throat> that are wrapped up in that about the Mississippi Drive. And um, Alan, we're going to start with you. I hadn't thought about putting that uh, before, before a referendum. And I'd say at the moment, uh, probably I would not be in favor of that because I would treat it like uh, any other Muscatine Street. Uh, Mississippi Drive obviously needs improvement, uh, whether it needs the degree of improvement and the expense that's currently being proposed. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced of that yet. Uh, there have been a lot of discussion down on what used to be called or is still called the Carver Corners about, you know, do you make that a T intersection? Do you make it a roundabout? Do you traffic lights. Uh, all I can say at this moment is I'm not a big fan of roundabouts. I think that's an expense that's not justified at that corner. And it, it was pointed out by a citizen uh, last night at one of our forums that since, particularly since the bypass has been uh, gone in, the traffic on Mississippi Drive is not anything like it used to be. And really, uh, in my years of traveling across town, going to work at GPC, that Carver Corners, which is always is, seems to be a focal point, point, is not that tough of an intersection to navigate the way it is now. So uh, I guess uh, I, would, I would promote uh, improvements in the Mississippi Drive Corridor, but uh, like I said, maybe not to the extent that's being proposed at the moment. Thanks very much. Jeanette? I would like to see that go out to a referendum to the voters but I would like to see the plan modified or else let the voters decide which way they want it because I've already had people talking to me about the roundabout and they just don't think we need it here in town. So maybe at the same time we do that, we could get a vote on the traffic cameras. What do you think? That's probably gonna be up to somebody else. Yep, okay. Um, we, um, we are at about our 20 minute limit for this and so our audience question time is over and each candidate will now have one minute for a closing <coughs> statement. So Jeanette, we're going to start with you and if you'd like to say, um, tell us what you'd like to say to the audience, um, in closing. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we covered quite a few points already here. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank Mayor Dick O'Brien for all his years of service. Mm -hmm. He really, it was a job really well done. And he did, besides all of the ribbon cuttings and the meetings and all of that, he also was involved with very major projects, such as the Pearl City Project, 
um, relocating the um, boat launch, renovating the building at the Riverview Center, the Discovery Center, the Environmental Learning Center, and the Skate Park. So thank you, Dick. Thank you. Okay, Alan, a closing statement? I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for uh, putting on this forum and inviting the candidates to speak. I think it's one of the best ways to uh, inform the citizens of Muscatine uh, who the candidates are and uh, what their thoughts are in running the city. Uh, I would I certainly appreciate the opportunity to serve as a fifth ward councilman. Uh, I have a, uh, a high interest in the city government and I would like to be a part of the uh, future decisions, decisions that are being uh, made uh, as far as the direction the city will take. Thank you very much. We're going to take about a two minute stretch break and we're going to ask the uh, candidates uh, for the fifth ward to join the audience and the candidates for mayor to come forward. Thank you very much.
Okay. All right. Well, we're back again. Thanks, everybody, for um, staying with us. I'd like to introduce the mayoral candidates. On November the 8th, uh, your ballot, on your ballot, you'll find that there are four candidates for mayor. And tonight, we're going to hear the ideas from these candidates. I'm pleased to introduce um, Diane Roby, Dwayne Hoppy Hopkins, Kim Otto, and Roger w Roth. They'll each have two minutes to answer the first question, which was provided to them in advance, and it is, what characteristics do you have that make you a, the choice for mayor? And would you please share your vision for the future of Muscatine? Um, we're going to start uh, with Diane Roby. And so if you'd please answer those questions, we'd appreciate it. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Sue, and the League of Women Voters and the audience that's here this evening. Um, first, I'd like to let you know that I have a husband of 31 years who supports me, which is very much appreciated. Thank you, David. <laughs> and I also have uh, four children and five grand girls, so I'm proud to be a grandma. So with that, I think that the characteristics besides being a good grandma would be the fact that, that make me uh, a good mayor for your community is the fact that I can facilitate teamwork and that requires the knowledge of team relations and how it's, uh, that takes place. I was your postmaster for 33 years totally before I retired and I managed three unions. Uh, processing and develop delivery of a mail uh, demonstrates the ability to direct and uh, coordinate those group efforts and provide a service and that's just one of many activities I have volunteered a lot throughout the community and each over the years and each time you volunteer on another project you learn um, what that what we can do to benefit our community and so it divides leadership skills as well as uh, I am a coach and a mentor uh, this evening I have with me Jenny Sosa who's a student at MCC at the college and um, she is uh, learning the government process through her uh, class at school so she has decided to join us this evening too uh, I have four years on city council, uh, two years as mayor pro tem. I've been through four budget sessions, goals, objectives, and strategic planning. My vision for Muscatine is to build on the past, but to move forward in the future, developing what we've already have been going on is the quality of life for our health, appearance of our city, tourism, economic development, and communications through our website and our media outlets. I want to lead Muscatine. I want to be part of that team that leads into the future of what has already been developed. Thank you. Thank you. We'll turn next to uh, Dwayne Hoppy Hopkins. Thank you, Sue. Uh, and I must say it's a little bit different being on this side of the fence than on that side of the fence. Uh, <laughs> That's and, uh, the truth. Uh, I, I want to thank you and the, and the League of Women Voters for putting this together. And my, look how it's grown. I know. Isn't it such, great? Such a success over the years. Good. Well, uh, as Sue alluded to, my name is Dwayne Hopkins, uh, more commonly referred to as Hoppy. I've lived in Muscatine my entire life, with the exception of a year in Wilton, a year in Iowa City, and uh, my military, uh, my military duty. Uh, I see myself in this scenario as. Uh, well, let me back up to, to define the mayor. I see the mayor as a goodwill ambassador, a public relations person, a sales manager. Uh, and all that goes with marketing as well as, uh, you know, ruling with an iron fist as the Mayor O'Brien has done, council sessions uh, to include budget sessions. And I've sat in on a few of those myself. Uh, so I see myself as fitting that description and I agree with Diane on just, just about every point that she has made in moving this city forward. There's things that we can do. There's things that I think uh, the council has uh, kind of set on their hands uh, in the past few years. Uh, we just need to pick up our, ourselves up by the bootstrap and move forward. There's, there's no, you know, there's no I in team and the council is definitely a team and I think the council needs to de dedicate itself, each and every one of the council members to include the mayor to be that, uh, that cheerleader for the community. We have a great community, just not a lot of people know about that. Thank you. And Kim Otto. Well, uh, I, I can't disagree with the, what these guys have said. In fact, I, 
think I can do probably just about as good as what the Wayne was saying here. We should all work together and do the best we can here uh, and make Muscatine better for the citizens here. In fact, in fact, I can't think of anything more than what they have already said to say about Muscatine. Thank you very much. Roger, can you share with us your vision for the future of Muscatine and why, what characteristics you've got that make you mm -hmm. the choice for mayor? I've been on a notary republic for many years. I've been in the military 12 years, nine here in the National Guard and transferred to Germany during the Cold War for the last three. Uh, I'm presently also working with the National Weather Service to help them uh, in relation to storms for the protection of the rest of the citizens. Um, as an individual, a lot of people usually come to me about things about government. If not because of a notary, most likely because they figure I might know, and I usually give them an answer, which is okay for the general public because they need to know about their government. This government fell into disarray because the people we're not educated into government as to what it's supposed to be. We hear presidents and members of Congress are saying democracy all the time. Excuse me, it's supposed to be a constitutional republic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take some audience questions next uh, for the mayoral candidates and uh, another high school. Uh, 11th grade G squared student is with us and this is Clarissa Ortiz. She's going to be um, selecting uh, the order of our questions and reading them to the candidates. So Clarissa, what's our first question? Please share your views on the roles and responsibilities of a mayor in Mus of Muscatine. Okay, so I'm um, happy we're going to start with okay. you All right. and Thank you've you. got um, Gee, I think you've got a minute and a half to answer that. Okay, uh, appreciate that very much. Good question. Uh, I think I expressed a little bit of that. I also see the mayor uh, not, not just as a cheerleader, a public relations person, a sales manager, uh, but I also see the mayor as a lobbyist. Uh, some people will talk to the mayor, and perhaps they won't talk to their council person, or, per, or even in some cases, some people don't even know who their council person is. Uh, I think the mayor is probably the most visible of all the city council members, uh, so he has to wear, or she, has to wear a lot of hats. Uh, I see myself in that role. Thank you. Uh, Kim, would you let us know what you think the role of mayor is? Well, well I think the role of mayor is to be a cheerleader, to coach people to listen to what they have to say and try and work with the people and get get whatever the people want done and basically to kind of like listen to what they were wanting to try and do. The mayor can't do too much without the people's input. Uh, they should listen to what they have to say. Um, that's about it. Thank you very much. Roger? The mayor's job is basically a, a smaller version of being the governor or a president. They all have different hats, just like uh, a mayor would, except his is geared more, more to the local level. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Diane? Yes, thank you. Um, the Iowa Code 372 says a mayor has a two official roles. One is presiding the officer over the city council meetings and two, the chief executive officer of the city and making sure they carefully balance the policy making and administrative duties. Um, the, um, 
Iowa League of Cities and the Institute of Public Affairs and the University of Iowa put together a handbook for policy for leaders that I, for Iowa municipalities. And I assure you, if elected mayor, I probably will be referencing that book frequently. But I see the role of a mayor as also your spokesperson, but also representing you in this community in a very uh, respected role. Thank you. Thank you. Clarissa? What are the two most important things you would like to see accomplish the first year you are in office? And what are your ultimate goals in making Muscatine a better place? Kimato, we'd like you to take those questions first. Well, the two things I'd like to accomplish the first year. Yep. Uh, well, I'd like to work on improving public safety and I would like to accomplish uh, uh, affordable housing here for the people of Muscatine. Okay, thank you. Roger? We have gone backwards. When uh, Mr. Fitzgerald was a private, so to speak, and city council, they had a situation concerning uh, the city fire department wanting to expand further out so they could get to the uh, fire and emergency situations that much quicker. It's been too long to, uh, for us. We can't be playing the hurry up and wait when it comes to public safety. It is a priority, a very big priority. I would not want to be the person in an accident that's going to die because a city council or its mayor decided to hurry up and wait all the time for to put emergency where it's needed that could save my life. Thank you. Thank you. Diane Roby? Well, there's a lot of things that I, my mind rolls that I'd like to accomplish. Uh, a lot of things have already been done. I stated in the past that we've, that we've already got the a good ground laid, but we need to move forward in the future. I want to continue with safety with uh, providing uh, fire department and police protection improve um, those safety aspects for our community. I'd like to see our community grow with pride. Recently, one of the topics that came up was um, from the National Citizen Survey is that people do not have as positive attitude about our community as that many of us already do, thinking it is in pretty good shape. So I'd like to improve the communications in our community and up that ante so that we all can walk around and speak well of our city. There are so many little things that can come forth. I want, really would like to continue those discussions with the Citizen Action Team that we work together on brainstorming those ideas uh, with the businesses and how we can make improve projects working with the community, with businesses, with nonprofits, with the citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Happy? I, I wish everyone that's in the room right now could have been here an hour and a half ago to listen to our Muscatine High School juniors in their presentation. They covered topics such as traffic lights, uh, you know, the things, a lot of things that were included in the survey that the city did, uh, but they used a little bit different terms. One of the terms that sticks out in my mind is economic gardening. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's an interesting term. Has nothing really to do mm -hmm. with green life, but it has everything to do with tax base and, and retail sales and, and strengthening this community. I mean, I think we all long for a better downtown. I think we all long for a better uh, Muscatine Mall. Uh, I think we all long for a Target store. Uh, I've heard this anyway. Can we accomplish this all in a year? No. I, I think, and I'm a football fan, so I'm going to use a football analogy. If we look at it uh, all the things that the students laid out and and picture them on a football field which, which is broken down in five yard increments and our goal is to get past get to the goal line and take off what we can every five yards in terms of goals accomplishable goals are they doable and move forward in that direction thank you Clarissa. what's next we now have a rather comprehensive recycling program. Do you believe residential citizens should continue having essentially unlimited garbage pickup? What alternatives would you consider? Roger, we're going to let you take that one first. Fifth Amendment talks about fair compensation, includes garbage. 
If they're picking it up, they need to be compensated for the work they do. We need to be compensated for where it goes. We need to be compensated for the fair wear and tear on vehicles. But we got to do it in a fair way so that everyone pays the same price without discrimination to the general public. Thank you. Okay. Diane? Oh, yes. You know, since we've gone to the recycling, uh, curbside recycling was the, probably the hottest issue this last year. And the most talked about topic wherever I went on Facebook or Twitter or emails or, or at the Y, everyone wants, wanted the curbside recycling and is still like it. You know that we've collected 621 tons since that was implemented in April of this year. And the refuge collection Sorry. expenditures for 2010-11 were under by $725. Now that's another comprehensive part of the entire recycle program of, because we're doing recycle, we're doing, I call it west weight, weight, uh, wet waste pickup. And it is confusing, but some of the funds are going into, we have to find the deficit we have at the landfill has to be recaptured and we have to maintain and reduce the deficit at the transfer station. So it is a complicated portion of finding that balance, but I assure you we do that with the help of finance director at the city and working toward the goal, and we'll work on that in our, uh, in our budget session in February, I guess it'll be, of 2012. Thank you. Thank you. Hoppy, what, what's your thought on recycling? Five years ago, uh, and maybe it's a guy thing, I don't know, but uh, I threw everything in the same trash can at home. And, and my wife bought into the recycling uh, system, and, and the more she preached to me, the more I thought, well, okay, we'll put plastics here and newspapers here and cans here and so forth. Uh, and I didn't like having to haul them, throw them in my vehicle and haul them to, to the nearest container. The, the new system is kind of the old system for Hoppy, and that's throwing everything you know, in the same container. I think it's absolutely great. Now, is it a fair balance uh, economically? Is, is it coming out that way uh, in terms of uh, city budget? Uh, I, I, I'm not in a position to really know, but I think we should continue because it's saving Mother Earth. And we do have to be accountable for Mother Earth. Thank you. Kim? Well, I think we should continue on with what we're doing right now. Uh, see where it goes. I mean, like Dwayne said, we got to save Mother Earth. Uh, for that reason alone, we should just keep on doing what we're doing right now and see where it goes. And I think we should keep it as is. Thank you. Okay. Our next question. KW. QC TV in Davenport reports 100 home foreclosures in Muscatine. What can and will do you, you do to improve e economic, economy. or e economy yeah. mm -hmm. in Muscatine? Okay. And we're going to start this round with Diane Roby. Oh, aren't I lucky? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Foreclosures and economy. Foreclosures and economy. The foreclosures are hard to see because we do get a report at council meetings, which by the way, all our council, everything we have is on our city website, which is an awesome website. You can, anything that we, the council have, you have the ability to see also. Um, one of the, it was mentioned earlier, economic uh, gardening, and I think maybe that might be one direction to go with helping to build the economy in Muscatine. Economic gardening is a term that has been around for a while and some cities have used it. And I brought a sample of what to explain what that might be. Uh, economic gardening, I visited with uh, uh, Jay McKee, a McKee Button. And you know, times have hit him pretty tough too with the changes. But here, Jay, bless his heart, gave me two coasters and it wasn't over $2.99, by the way. And, but these are made out of byproducts of resin that he has at his business, this is pro his factory. Now these are coasters, one of them happens to be just a resin, this one he has mixed in corn. We're an industry town, here's economic gardening. His business might be hurting with the button factory or industry, but you can take his byproduct and make another business that is economic gardening 
ladies and gentlemen. That's what we can do in this community, which in turn will help homes and jobs and the economy for Muscatine. Thank you. Thank you. Happy? It all starts with the economy. Uh, and, and we can sit here in, in our community and we can feel sorry for ourselves because nationally the economy, well actually on, on the global picture, the, the economy really isn't very good mm -hmm. uh, and doesn't paint a very positive picture. Or we can ask ourselves as visionaries uh, and leaders in the community, what can we do, and I'll, and I'll use the example of a man or a woman uh, on the riverfront wanting to just sell a bag of popcorn and try to make 25 cents. If we stand in the way of that simple activity, we're standing in the way of economic development. So uh, again, I think if we ask ourselves, what can we do to encourage entrepreneurism? Uh, what kind of ideas can we come up with as a team to, to talk about? Uh, my sister-in-law owns a retail store in DeKalb, Illinois. Uh, could I suggest to her that she branch out uh, with a second store in Muscatine, Iowa. It's a, it's a market specific store and I, and I envision that in downtown Muscatine. Just an idea. Uh, but again, <laughs> are we standing in the way of economic development or are we encouraging it? Thank you. Kim Otto? Well, I think it, you've raised several good points here. And the question is, what are we doing to encourage businesses to come here in Muscatine? And I don't see that we're doing a whole lot right now. And we need to try and find ways to encourage them, maybe give them tax credits or something of this kind. And Diane brought up a good point. You some of some of the green stuff that we can use, recycle, make a new business. But basically, we got to figure out what we're doing wrong here, and that's about it. Thank you, Roger. Well, thanks, uh, Green thing that they're talking about is diversifying businesses. A long time ago the, the uh, radio station had something about small businesses and how important they're with all the major uh, uh, stores that are coming into town. And I said to them, you mentioned a saw shop. When your small business is, is on to one product, they are the experts of that product as opposed to a major uh, store chain that has multitudes of products. Uh, we need to diversify also for the middleman because they are the backbone of what we are and what we can expect from them as far as excellence in their products and what they can do as far as the upkeep of those products like maybe a lawnmower blade. Thank you. Okay. What have we got next, Clarissa? <laughs> what will you do to bring jobs to Muscatine? Mm. Hmm. Okay. Bringing jobs to Muscatine. Hoppy, can you expand on that? Sure can. Sure can. <clears throat> Having spent a year working for the National Federation of Independent Business, and for those of you that don't know uh, much about that organization, they are, they are the only advocate for small business in the world, actually, uh, and they, they exercise uh, the ability to lobby the federal government Legislators will pass laws that would be good for the HNIs of the world, but they wouldn't be good for uh, Hopkins Saw Shop, a little one-man operation. So legislators uh, and lobbyists will try to balance that playing field. To encourage there again, entrepreneurism and, and small businesses to, to open up in downtown Muscatine or, or out near the mall or whatever, that is the backbone of, of the United States. They employ the most people. Uh, they pay most of the bills. So entrepreneurs, promoting entrepreneurism. Very good, thank you. Kim Otto. Well, Dwayne brings up 
several good points here. Um, I can't think of anything more to say than what he's already said. Okay. Roger? Well, all your small entrepreneurs uh, sell the products of major corporations. If you can possibly link both of them together, and I'm going to talk to maybe one or two corporate identities here in town, see if that can work on a longer scale like it's supposed to. The major manufacturers manufacture it. The little guy down here in town sells it. Uh, we also have to look at the possibility of uh, possible tax breaks. Because like I said last night, when you got property taxes to go with the store, like maybe downtown here, it's going to be part of the cost and it's going to be part of the sale. And it's going to, uh, just in some cases, will discourage the uh, individual from wanting to buy because of the price. Uh, and all this, I think we have a long look at for a, for a while. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The journal has stories of arrest for illegal drug possession and delivery, sexual and domestic abuse, and other serious crimes in Muscatine most, almost daily. If you are elected, please give at least one action you would suggest to decrease the inc incidence of crime in Muscatine. Yeah. This was a question that we heard, but the, the person that wrote the question wanted it to be presented to both the council members and the mayoral candidates. So we're going to um, start with Kim Otto. And if you, the, the person wants to know how you would try to decrease crime and violence in Muscatine. Well, at this point in time, I really don't have too many ideas on this. I would have to do some research, uh, check in to see what the biggest problems are around town. And that's about it right now. Thank you. Roger? Years ago, we had a big problem with uh, gangs. I talked to the editor of the Muscatine Journal, which I was a newspaper carrier, and he says, why don't you take all these gang-related uh, situations on the front page and keep them in the police section, and all the kids that are doing all the good things in town, put them on the front page. When the gang members found out they weren't being number one on the spot front page, things kind of quieted down. And the kids tonight have done something else tonight that was of good. Idle hands, idle tongue, tools of the devil. Uh, the Bible also talks about sins that so easily beset. To get rid of that, you've got to give them something to do where they don't want to do the crime. And your idea concerning a teen center, wonderful. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Diane? Yes, thank you. Um, What was our question again? The now? question, <laughs> the, the question had to do with violence and yeah. crime in the okay. community. And um, Clarissa, could you repeat it? Yeah. The journal has stories of arrest for illegal drug possession and delivery, sexual and domestic abuse, and other serious crimes in Muscatine almost daily. If you are elected, please give at least one action you would suggest to decrease the incidence of crime in Muscatine. Yep. Okay. I d thank you, because that's a loaded question, because number one, what you read in the paper is just that, it's media news reporting, and that's what media does, and they're reporting those crimes and those actions, which we now do not necessarily like. But what we are fortunate for in Muscatine, we have uh, services that can provide for those people of domestic abuse and sexual assault. We have the uh, programs that is very well run. They also work well with our police department. The uh, police department recently was approved uh, a grant for two officers. Uh, that we have to believe have in place for four years and then we have to pay for the fifth year. Uh, one of those will be assigned to a part-time um, at the school working well, a liaison officer at the school and the other one is going to be assigned to um, um, street crimes 
because that's especially, as the chief uh, Talkington has explained to me, they have to become specialized in that field to really know the communications with the gangs. And uh, she, Chief Talkington is making some nice strides in improving those relationships in the community. Thank you. Happy? I agree with a great deal with what Roger and, and Diane uh, both said. I'd also uh, like to see a program with our two chiefs, our, our chief of police and our, and our fire chief, uh, whereby they, they become salesmen of their trades. Uh, in other words, go to the school system, the middle schools and, and the high school in, in their dress uniforms and portray themselves. And it's actually not a portrayal. They are heroes. Look at the, look at the heroes of 911. Uh, emergency responders, the policemen and the firemen that, that participated in that rescue attempt. Uh, they're no different here on the local level. Uh, we need to show these kids that they are heroes and that these kids can become heroes as well. Uh, and a lot of that has to do and is tied in with economic development. We're suffering some economic tough times right now. And when the economy goes down, crime rate seems to go up. So again, addressing one could solve the problem or address the problem of the other. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you want to take that one next? Okay. Okay. Uh, property taxes continue to rise while property values continue to decline. Do you see this as a problem? If so, what would you do about it if elected? And for Roger, if you do not approve of property taxes, how will the city pay for police, fire department, street sewers, and other services? Roger, we're going to start with you. North Dakota is already starting an idea. They got a proposal to the city, to the citizens, to do away with property taxes at the uh, state constitution. Property taxes uh, is part of the problem, not the solution. If you raise property taxes, you're not going to have people coming to town. They want to go someplace else where it's cheaper. It's only natural. It's, it gives the chances like Fruitland and other communities who may have lesser property taxes to become your next city of Muscatine in the, in the future. You want to, uh, it's like I told them, it's a fight that I'm trying to resolve with a way that we fair to everybody, and it's hard. When you got people like President Obama who spends more money than all the presidents in the United States causing our uh, property taxes to go up through the banks because they need the money too. I'm sorry, but we're we're in a we're in a dire straits. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, would you like to have it repeated? <laughs> the the first question. Yeah, it probably wouldn't hurt for all okay. of us. Okay. Property taxes continue to rise while property values continue to decline. Do you see this as a problem? If so, what would you do about it if elected? Well, first place, uh, you need to know that the city of Muscatine ha didn't, has not raised property taxes. If you take, if you look at your tax statement and you add your county taxes and your city of Muscatine taxes together, they are lower than what the school taxes were raised. So your actual last tax statement, because I got this question a lot, your actual tax raise was due to the school system. So that in turn you can't look at the city for did what we try to do is not raise your property taxes and for the year that just ended we didn't raise your property taxes which will be for the next following year now can we continue to maintain that i don't know the economy is really tough uh, and it depends on what our state does in the legislation this year because now we have to absorb the uh, pension funds for the fire department, police department into our budget and cover those costs, which I think the figure, I shouldn't even say a figure because if I'm not, re yeah, I probably won't. I only got 30 seconds left. So because it might be wrong anyway, but those are costs that we are continuing to have to absorb in the city's budget and please come to a city council uh, come to our budget sessions we're there for two weeks we'd love to have you sitting with us for eight nine hours a day thank you <laughs> Happy, what do you think uh, Diane is, is, is accurate uh, I, I think our state legislators uh, and our city officials have to keep an open line of communication 
and I know right now the, the line's probably too open because the, the city administrator and one of our House of Representatives is having a bit of a debate over uh, that very issue, property taxes. Uh, I'm assured by one of our, our local legislators that there will be relief and it will be at the, the very top of, of the priority list uh, at the beginning of the, the next session in January and that possibly by July there may be some relief in sight. So uh, that, that's, that may be a little bit of wishful thinking, but I do know that legislators across the state are hearing the same thing from their constituents and property taxes are, are something that's a, a serious problem. Thank you. Kim? Well, Diane and Hoppy, they're both right. Um, the legislators are, have to work on it and everything else. Um, I would have to look into what the city is actually doing on property taxes to see if there is any changes that can be made to lower them or something of this kind. And that's about it. Thank you. Um, the next question is when, and we're going to start with Diane on this next question. When budget talks begin next year, will you be open and willing to recommend uh, to having city employees pay more for their health insurance? And uh, I think they'd like an explanation of whatever your position would be on that. Sure. They. Um the city employees have already been already been paying a percentage, but to be honest with you, my mind isn't going there right now as to what that percentage is. So they've already paid, are paying some, mm -hmm. um, and so are is uh, supervisory staff. So if there is a need, depending on what the rates come in for the raise in health insurance, that'll be reviewed at budget time. We'll take all those pieces to the puzzle together and see what needs to be done and what percentage for each of the departments it needs to be raised depending on what health care rates come in at and certainly I'm not opposed to everyone paying their share thank you happy uh, and I agree with Diane in addition there's an initiative that Diane's fully familiar with uh, and being promoted by the governor of the state of Iowa uh, in a partnership forming a partnership with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, as well as High V and Fairway uh, and it's a health initiative. Now, any time we can be accountable ourselves for our own health, uh, and maybe that's walking seven blocks a day, or instead of having uh, French fries with your quarter pounder and cheese, ask for fresh fruit, things of that nature. My point being is that if we take care of ourselves and start to lead a more active, healthy life, then there's less claims less claims means a reduction in insurance rates. Uh, the, the initial question is, and again, I agree with Diana, it has to be under review at the time of the budget session. Okay. Kim, what do you think about um, health care costs at budget time? Well, I have to agree with the way in here. Uh, we should be accountable for our, our own insurance and everything and do the best we can to lower them and if that means like you said walking seven blocks or eight blocks or whatever we should do that and that'd be about it thank you roger health insurance costs well, when Larry Wolf was head of Park and Rec, he encouraged them at a, during the summertime to have a, like maybe a walking contest so you can get the most miles up to a maximum as far as their health was concerned. As far as the costs are concerned, it has to be a year-by-year -year basis as to what we're looking at in hopes to keep the costs down for the, uh, the maximum amount of care that's allowed by law because things do happen. Murphy's Law is out there. It's going to cause trouble and we're going to have to have the backup for the employee that it happens to. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Clarissa, another question. If it becomes necessary to cut a significant amount, say 400000 from the budget, where would you suggest cuts be made? 
And we're going to start with Hoppy on this one. Cuts. Boy, that is a great question. Uh, you know, my mom is in attendance here tonight. She works for Senior Resources, and she's a very young and fresh 83 years of age. But the department that she works for, their budget was cut. So she's obviously not happy about that. Oh, by the way, I want to say hi to the the residents of Hershey Manor. I'm, I forgot I'm supposed to do that. Uh, you know, that's that's very tough. I mean, you, you, you need you need the, the safety and protection that the fire and police department uh, uh, offer, and that takes money. Uh, you need to upgrade infrastructure. That takes money. Uh, I, I can't answer that question. I, I don't. I don't honestly know. It's it's a tough situation, and it gets tougher every budget session. Okay, thank you, Kim. If you had to cut, where would it be? I I actually honestly don't know where I would have to cut. I mean, it's like the way you said it is getting tougher and getting harder to figure out where to cut. We need police. We need fire. We need to continue improve the roadways so where do we cut uh, I got no idea where we would have to cut it's really hard thank you Roger you would not cut uh, your essential services first to do with public safety and health you'd have to start somewhere that has nothing to do with it possibly you may have to shut down a park or two or maybe Worst case scenario, sell some of the land to uh, their uh, park land to uh, uh, someone that deals in uh, that area of expertise. But even so, the people's concerns come here. This is where you can also have your input. Yes, we will not uh, do anything to our fire and police and our uh, sewers because it's essential. Thank you. Diane? Well, I've sat through, as I stated earlier, four budget sessions um, representing you as fifth ward on city council. And by the way, as crazy it is, I love that. I, lo I love serving and representing the Muscatine. And each time we go through each depart, the budget session is presented with the city administrator and each section with uh, Nancy Leake, our finance director. And we go through each section, have a presentation from each department, hear what they think they need for their capital expenditures or where they could cut or downsize. We review each of those items. At the end, the council starts going through over all our notes we've taken. We review what possibly could be cut. 400 k has been cut. I don't remember. I'm easily from the budget before. We've gone through this process and more and sometimes in order to avoid raising taxes. Can we continue to do that? I don't know. I'm not going to make that promise because I assure you we do want sewers. We do want police protection. We do want fire protection. I want an ambulance to come and get me if need be. So those services are top priority as well. You'd be complaining if your garbage wasn't picked up. So how easily we could cut 400 k but we'll have to sit in the budget session uh, in 2012 in February doing that so please come join me thank you Clarissa another question will you pursue involuntary an annexation. annexation of the property outside of the bypass and if so what city services are you willing to provide those residents we're going to start with Kim Otto on that one uh -huh. I don't think I would pursue that because a lot of people outside, you simply don't want to be annexed inside into Muscatine. And I don't think we should make them. And I wouldn't make them. I'd just let, let them stay as is. And that's about it. Thank you. Roger. It becomes a constitutional matter. It comes to the will of the people. If they don't want to be, don't force them. We weren't forced to become a state. We were asked to become a state, and the federal government complied. If they don't, want, if we do have services that we could introduce to them, to possibly uh, move them in the direction of wanting to, fine. But that's their decision, not ours. Thank you, Diane. 
Yes, annexation, uh, as it was assigned to us as a goal, and or we, we the council, made our own goals and objectives for the year. So annexation was presented at an in-depth, and we've been talking about it. Our city planner uh, prepared us a lot of information. There are Iowa Code 368.11 through 368.22 deals with involuntary annexation, and it's not as easy as you think it might be. There's a city development board, which is addressed in the Iowa Code 368, and that it sets in like at the level of Des Moines when you refer to the city development board, you have to watch that term. And so that after, if we were to voluntarily or force them to annex into the city, then you have to go before a public hearing. Uh, the development board would have to requires us to set a special election by the county commissioner. So there's a lot of process. There's also another type of annexation called the 80-20, and I think that was mentioned earlier in the discussions by the fifth ward candidates. But the real question is, is it cost effective to the city of Muscatine? Are the benefits worth it? What can the city provide them that they haven't already? I believe our community's priority should be infill and cleaning up inside the city limits. I am not in favor of the forced annexation or you know, involuntary re referred to. And we need to take care of what's inside those city limits and improve there first before we merge outside and deal with an issue that's too difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Hoppy? Absolutely not. Uh, this is a government for the people. And when we start forcing people to do things that they don't want to do, we lose the concept of this free country that we've been living in. Uh, that's, that's a pretty broad statement. Uh, pretty accurate. And I agree with Diane, we, we need to do things within the city to make it so attractive to live in the city that those people that have chosen to live in stick houses in suburbs want to sell those houses and move back into town. I firmly think that that can be done. Thank you. Okay, Clarissa, what have we got? Speak about historic preservations as economic development, please. So we're going to start with Roger. Historic preservation. How could historic preservation be part of an economic development plan for the city of Muscatine? It's going to be interesting how to do that in the first place. You got it all across the nation of historic preservations. I even talked to Santa Grassi when they got that old barn going because it was a rarity of its own kind for a uh, national icon from their point of view, but I didn't get uh, the positive response I was looking for. They had other things to do. But uh, we are the first, uh, the first state on the west side, on the other side of the Mississippi that had the first president. For example, was he here? If so, we got a plus. Uh, it's a shot. But for me, it's a shot in the dark because we got other things that we can also need to do to try to help get this community really going to compete with the major cities like Davenport. Thank you. Yes. Diane? Um, economic uh, development and uh, historic preservation um, and TIF can all come to play because there can be tax dollars, TIF tax dollars to enhance the historic preservation of particular areas and I have to admit that that the historic preservation is not my most forte but I've got Dan Clark to refer to whenever I need him for all the knowledge on historic preservation and what can be done in our community if there are areas and believe it or not historic preservation and um, TIF all came up in the discussion of the Blue Zone meeting uh, about the initiatives for the blue zone in helping our community the application process so in that direction if we have an opportunity to enhance a historic area absolutely let's do it thank you happy I think if you ask the city officials from Galena Illinois if historic preservation has been uh, a part of their total economic boost I think they'd, they'd say uh, without a question of a doubt mm -hmm. yeah and Kim Otto. Well, I think we should uh, work on historical preservation 
and it definitely can be an economic boost to the economy because there is tax money available, TIF money, um, several other sources. Uh, I guess that'll be about it. Okay, I think we're going to take one more of these questions and then we're going to wrap this up. Do you favor one of Mississippi Drive Corridor Project's alternati alternatives? If so, which one? And do you have any concerns about this project? If so, what are they? Diane, we're going to start with you. Well, I'm lucky again. That's a uh, topic the uh, in cooperation with Stanley Consultants and uh, Steve Boca's office uh, and all the people who have had worked on that together the presentation was made to the public um, last week I believe it was anyway if you haven't seen those maps and those proposals please take a look at them there are four options um, what I want to do is if if Number one, the federal government gives us the tax dollars to do it. That's a big if. We need to improve the Mississippi corridor. And that would go all the way from the bridge to Carver Corner, which I think really the big question everybody is asking, is Carver Corner and do I want a roundabout? I want what is cost effective for the city of Muscatine because we're going to have to say, uh, pay our percentage of that, even though we're getting money from the federal government. First, we have to get the project approved. Steve Book is well, way into that project. We do need it improved at to what level, I don't know yet because we don't have the funding approved. But I will reply to that when the time comes. Thank you, Happy. Uh, I, I agree with Diane. Uh, we need to do it. Uh, as long as we have you know, uh, a, a really neat riverfront, and I've been around long enough to know when Pearl City Station was in fact a warehouse, and there were silos down there. Uh, full of grain and there were rats big as footballs uh, but the but the riverfront is a thing of beauty i i spent 30 years of my life chasing the the very elusive uh largemouth black bass uh, for from the ohio river 150 miles either side of louisville the mississippi river from lacrosse to keokuk lakefront properties and i can remember that in the beginning of that 30-year fishing career i, I wasn't very I wasn't bragging on Muscatine's riverfront, but I brag on it now. In fact, I'm so proud of it that I have been instrumental in bringing uh, fishing, organized fishing events to Muscatine. And believe it or not, uh, a field of 200 participants uh, is good for about two, two and a half million dollars left in Muscatine in hotel motel uh, purchases, food, gasoline, things of that nature. So yeah, I, I'm in favor of uh, of one of the plans that, you know, the the general consensus, consensus that I'm hearing is a roundabout is not a good thing. Uh, but there are, are two other options for that particular corner. Uh, and I am in favor of improving uh, the corridor, yes. Very good, thank you. Kim Otto? Well, since we've got the bypass in, the traffic is not down there. And all we need to do is resurface it. And Basically, why fix something that is not broken? We can probably find somewhere else better to spend that money. I mean, there, like I said, the traffic is not there. I mean, the riverfront is looking really good. And I can't see spending any money just to put sidewalks down there. Uh, put some kind of roundabout in there we really don't need. I mean, the intersection is safe. I get through there with no problem. I haven't seen any major wrecks or anything in the last four years. So, uh, why fix it? It's not broken. Let's just leave it be. Thank you. Roger? Um, uh, the riverfront road down near 61 was part of our historical road that went from Louisiana all the way up along the Mississippi River. It was the old Great River Road. Yes, we have to do something to it to improve. Someone told me if he was coming into Muscatine a long time, boy, see the industry in the south end as you're coming in. Hey, they got a good industry level. 
They see the businesses downtown. Hey, we got good businesses here, and so on. Yeah, we need to do some improving there. It's the what they see first that gives them the impression as they go through town, hopefully even long enough to stop here and spend a little money for our, uh, for our needs as well as wherever they go to spend elsewhere. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now we're going to hear closing statements from the mayoral candidates. You'll each have one minute, and we're going to start with Diane. Okay. Again, thank you, League of Women Voters and all the helpers and uh, the G2 Humanities uh, students up there. You've been awesome. I really would look forward to working with you in the future. I really also thank my family, my grandchildren, I and my faith because without that, all that, you don't have any, you need that support to keep going. Dick O'Brien has served this community for many years and he has been a mentor and I watched him the last four years. It would be a real challenge. This community is going to go through a huge change. He's been already down to 30 seconds. He's all, he has served us for 16 years. Uh, I would like to serve so that I can focus on the community's future. And remember to vote on November 8th. Polls are open 7 to 8. And you can go in and vote right now if you want to. But would you do me a favor? Would you vote for me? Thank you. Happy? There's no I in team, but I, I want to share with you a story. December 25th, 1968, a good friend of mine disappeared off the face of the earth. He was an Air Force pararescue trooper, and he He's missing in action, and later on, statute of limitations declared dead. Uh, he disappeared or died, however you want to look at it, so that we could exercise our right to vote. And if you look, if you look at the voting records in Muscatine and the percentile of people that are registered versus the percentile of people that voted, it's, it's not very good. So as a veteran of Vietnam, speaking for the World War II veterans, the Korean veterans, the, the, the other my Vietnam veterans, uh, I'm just urging you to get out November 8th and call your family members and friends and urge them to get out and vote for one of the four of us. Thank you. Kim Otto? Well, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this together for us. And I'd like to thank the students for doing an awesome job tonight and encourage everyone to come out and vote. And everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Roger? I screwed up on the one question about recycling. I can just say that the Clark House has a beautiful recycling program at, at their place and they're using it quite well. I'm certain other places like for the elderly and otherwise that have one. It's a good way of uh, maybe even giving the city a little extra money because some of that stuff is worth recycling right to a store or a business that uh, will give you the money for it. As far as taxes are concerned, my wish would have been, if at all possible, our city lives off of the interest of its, of its uh, bank account and thus giving corporations and the people the chance to have more money for a constitutional economy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, the League of Women Voters of Muscatine County thanks all the candidates for their interest in serving our community. I'd like to thank the Muscatine High School uh, 11th grade G squared students, especially Joe Porter and Clarissa Ortiz who helped me tonight. Uh, and I appreciate so much that you have taken an interest in, our, in issues that relate to the city of Muscatine. I'd like to thank the city for um, allowing us into this space, Muscatine Power and Water Cable, and uh, Muscatine Community College Video Department with Brad Hesford and Chad Bishop, and providing cable broadcast and rebroadcast of this event. Um, for those uh, particularly upstairs and those perhaps in the viewing audience and here tonight who are not registered to vote, there are three easy ways to do that. You can register at the polls. You can go to the county auditor's office in the county administrative building, or you can mail in a completed voter registration form that's found at the front of any telephone directory. 
So if you have a telephone book at your house and you open it up to the front, you're going to find a voter registration form that you can fill out and mail in. The League of Women Voters encourages all citizens to learn about the issues, to register, and to vote, especially on November 8th. Thank you, and good night. Thank you.